1859, Charles Darwin published his book called The Origin of Species, which laid out his theory of evolution by natural selection. Quite simply, organisms change over long periods of time in response to their environment. Genetic variation causes slight differences within each new generation of a species. You are not a perfect copy of your parents. Well, good for you, you're wrong. Often, this variation does nothing, but sometimes it might just give that creature a small advantage. Perhaps the environment changes and there is not enough food for the species. A creature that was born with a genetic variation that made it smaller than others will then need less food. Because food is now scarce, that smaller creature has a better chance of surviving, reproducing and passing on that smaller gene to its offspring. Over time, natural selection like this will begin to favour members of the species that are better suited to their new environment. Given enough time, these changes can result in entirely new species forming. This is evolution. Every generation is classed as the same species as its parents, but over the course of millions of years, these tiny, gradual changes do add up in a very big way. This process affects every living thing on the planet, including humans. In a century and a half since Darwin's book, many people still ask, did humans evolve from apes? My name is Danny Berg, let's find out the answer, and also why that might not even be the right question, here on Life's Biggest Questions. One of the biggest misconceptions is that humans evolved from modern apes. The thing is, we are apes. Along with orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and many other subspecies, we make up the ape family. So, if we didn't evolve from apes, where did we evolve from? Well, all species in the ape family share a common ape-like ancestor. Essentially, chimps, gorillas, and orangutans are our genetic cousins, and this common ancestor is like the great-great-great-grandparent of all of us. We know this because, for example, we share almost 99% of our genetic sequence with our closest relative, chimpanzees. There are now thousands of fossils that chronicle each split and progression from that single common ancestor that lived in Africa to all the modern apes we see today, including us. This single species began to split towards all these different groups as far back as 17 million years ago. The group that included human ancestors first split away from the group that would evolve into gibbons, then they split away from orangutan ancestors, then gorillas ancestors, and then finally, about 7 million years ago, a very important split happened. One group became the ancestors of modern day chimpanzees and bonobos, and the other started doing something very human-like. They started walking on two legs. This trait is known as being bipedal, making this branch a lot more human-like. So, why did this happen? Well, if you remember at the start of the video, we talked about how evolution is stimulated by environmental change. And for this distant ancestor of ours living in Africa all those millions of years ago, their environment certainly did change. They lived in the trees of dense rainforests that were rapidly disappearing due to natural climate change as the planet got cooler and drier. Out on the new African savanna, with no trees to climb for protection, our ancestors needed to run from predators. There's also some evidence to suggest that if you're not swinging between trees, walking on two legs uses less energy than knuckle walking on four, another advantage for our ancestors. It's hotly debated among anthropologists about when exactly the first true upright walker lived, but the one that everyone can agree on is that a species known as Australopithecus regularly walked upright about four million years ago. But other than walking upright, Australopithecus still weren't very human-like. They had small brains, were mainly herbivores, and couldn't speak. We know this by studying fossils, such as one of the most famous fossils of all time, an Australopithecus named Lucy. Lucy, found in 1974. She was named after the Beatles song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds that was playing at the dig site. But evolution is a relentless process. Things continue to change and about two and a half million years ago, the fossil records tell us that a new species had emerged. Homo habilis. If you think the first part of that sounds familiar, then you might be thinking of Homo sapiens, better known as us, humans. That's no accident either. At the moment, they're regarded as the first member of the Homo family, and all subsequent members are notably more human-like than anything before Homo habilis. Homo habilis had smaller teeth and a smaller jaw, much closer to ours. Their hands were more similar too, and with these human-like hands and bigger brains, they did something that none before them had. They made tools. Their name, Homo habilis, literally means handyman because of this. Then came Homo erectus about 1.8 million years ago. Although they still had protruding jaws, thick brows and no chin, they were even closer to us humans with their larger brains and skeletons that were now perfect for full-time bipedal walking. And walk they did, as Homo erectus is widely regarded as the first to boldly go where none had gone before and leave Africa. They crossed out into Southeast and East Asia, reaching India and China too, possibly following their hunting prey with their new improved tools and weapons. Homo erectus is also 
thought to have started intentionally using fire for the first time, for warmth, protection, and most importantly, to cook their food. Cooking food releases far more calories in that food, and with all these spare calories, over time, this led to a growth in brain size. Over the next million years, these humanoids began to split into smaller distinct groups, such as Homo heidelbergensis, who were thought to be the first species to bury their dead, and also use very primitive language. They were very successful, and their advanced hunting tools and more complex social interactions helped them spread into Europe, where they gradually evolved into Neanderthals, and into Asia, where they became Denisovans. At this point, there were now a number of different humanoid groups living on the planet, coexisting for many thousands of years. And then, 130,000 years ago, the African population of Homo heidelbergensis had evolved into Homo sapiens, who are the direct precursors to Homo sapiens sapiens, otherwise known as us, humans. If you look at the skeletons of these genetic cousins of ours, they almost seem indistinguishable to modern day humans, but there were differences between them. They were shorter and stockier than most humans, an adaptation to the cold weather in the northern hemisphere at that time. But in other ways, they were remarkably similar to us, and not the loutish cavemen popular in the mainstream media over the years. They used complex tools, buried their dead, and likely had speech and language closer to ours than the grunts of Homo heidelbergensis. And then, 40,000 years ago, the Neanderthals, Denisovans, and other Homo groups began to disappear from the fossil records, until the only ones left on the planet were us. So what happened? Did they all just die out? Well, yes, no, and we really don't know. At that time, the climate was fluctuating rapidly across the world, going from mild to freezing cold every few generations or less. The Neanderthals were already scattered into small, isolated groups when humans arrived on the scene. Humans had spent a while building up their numbers in Africa, allowing them to form complex social groups where they could quickly gain and share knowledge. This gave us a number of slight advantages over Neanderthals, and we developed better tools, more complex languages, intricate art to communicate between groups and across generations. The unforgiving climate and these behavioural differences, rather than physical, meant that humans began to move into the areas of Neanderthals, Denisovans and other hominids and begin to outcompete them to extinction. But our genetic cousins aren't completely gone. Before humans outlasted them, they interbred with them. These days, studies have found that about 4% of many humans' DNA is Neanderthal, Denisovan or even other as of yet unidentified humanoid species. So for a lot of humans today, these weren't just groups that existed alongside our ancestors, they are all also our ancestors in a very real way, living on within our DNA. And so too is the DNA of all who came before us. From Homo erectus to Australopithecus to our common ancestor with chimpanzees some 7 million years ago, and the ancestor of all modern apes 17 million years ago. We did not evolve the modern apes of today. We share a common ancestor. We are still trying to piece together the puzzle of our family history that goes back all those millions of years. New discoveries are being made all the time in both genetics and archaeology that mean our understanding of human evolution changes as often as one year to the next, as we fill in the blanks in our history. Still, there is so much left to understand about us, the hairless apes that climbed down from the trees and learned to walk, talk, create, and ask some of life's biggest questions. My name is Danny Burke, and if you're feeling especially connected to your fellow humans right now from around the world, then say hello in the comments section below, and let us know what questions you want to see answered next on the channel. I'll see you down there in the comments section, and I'll see you in the next video.